приятный. И вместе тем торжественный день. И сегодня книга прозвучит слово традиция. Во-первых, университет опирается на традицию. Во-вторых, традиция прихода посла Швейцарии на исторический факультет это тоже хорошая и добрая традиция. И традиция есть еще в одном в связи между Россией и Швейцарией. Я хотел бы упомянуть только два э, момента. Момент первый. В Швейцарии есть кантон, который называется Тичино. Этот кантон известен замечательными архитекторами. Эти архитекторы работали во многих странах, и в частности искусство итальянского барокко связано с именем крупнейшего архитектора Франческо Барамини, который как раз происходил из Тичино и работал в Риме. И Тарадзини тоже. Это следующая фраза, которую я okay. Но э, чеченцы работали не только в Италии, они работали и в России. И начало Петербурга связано с именем Доменика Трезини, замечательного архитектора, более того, архитектора, который сумел воплотить очень важную идею, столь волновавшую Петра Великого, о создании э, города, который будет неким вторым Римом. И в этом отношении создание Трезини в Петербурге Петропавловского собора как раз отвечало этой идее. Но еще один момент очень важный связывает Россию и Швейцарию. Это деятельность господина Лагарпа, который был воспитателем Александра I. И Лагарп привел ему те многие идеи, в первую очередь, конечно, русаистские идеи, которые потом столь ярко отразились в его деятельности, в его деятельности и человека, в его деятельности и правителя страны. И вот сейчас как раз... Должно получать в третий раз слово традиция, потому что не так давно на факультете э, с помощью людей, которые работают на факультете, был издан монументальный труд, трехтомный труд. Это переписка и документы, которые связывают Александра Первого и Лагарта. И в связи с этим приходил как раз предшественник господина Россия, который и выступал на презентации этой э, книги. Господин Россия занимается и по образованию юрист, учился в Монреале, в Брюге, в Фрибурне и э, работал очень долгие годы в Департаменте иностранных дел Швейцарии по вопросам интеграции. И сегодняшняя лекция как раз будет посвящена проблемам интеграции, проблемам Швейцарии, проблемам отношений Швейцарии, Швейцарии и Европы и проблемам нейтралитета. Я хочу представить вам сегодняшнего нашего ректора, посла Швейцарии в России, господина Ива Россия. Пожалуйста. Спасибо. Никогда раньше, только автор, после. Извините, мне нужно говорить по-английски. Я изучаю русский язык. И, во-первых, я буду рассказать вам одну маленькую сказку из Швейцарии. Я написал сказку. Был домашнее задание из э, моего преподавателя. Это история, история моста дьявола. В, в 13 веке жил был маленький город на север Альп, который называется Ури. Город был очень бедным, потому что Торговцы никогда не ездили туда, так как была на дороге на юг одна глубокая пропасть, где не был моста. Мэр города решил пойти с рабочими и попробовать строить мост. Они работали много дней, и, но эм, напрасно. Мэр сказал, только дьявол может строить мост здесь. Вечером, когда мэр был дома, кто-то постучал в дверь. Мэр от открыл дверь и видел черного человека, который ему сказал, я тебя слышал. Я буду строить, строить мост через три дня, но я воз возьму Возьму душу первого человека, который пойдет по мосту. Дьявол построил мост, 
sidjel, iš dal, no nikto ne prihadil. Takda mer talku kazla, kozla, kazla, kozla, lubuk, me, kazla, kozla, na most, i djavol dolžen bil vzjat i vo dušu. Djavolu bila um, dasavna, dasadna, što ljudi uri, abmanuli i vo, vzjal balšoj kamjen i hadil razrušat most. Adna stara ja ženšina videla djavola s kamenjem na jevo spinje i skazala jemu. Bjedni čelavijek, um, ti ustal na da sjest, pit i atihat. Djavol pasta vil kamjen, sidjel i pil vodu, katoru ju stara ja ženšina dala jemu. Va vremja tavo, kak djavol pil, Ženšina risovala krest na kamjen. Na kamjen. Djavol ni smog nasit kamjen i vjernul se vad. Kamjen išo tam. On vjesit tisiča ton i kakda strajili avtostradu 30 let nazad, nužna bila tri nedeli ravoti, što bi smestit ivo. Gavarjat, što pa prasili djavola pamagat im, no on atkazal se. Why do I tell you this story? <clears throat> Because the main factor in history is geography. Switzerland's history started in the 13th century when the technique of building bridges allowed to cross the Alps in the center the direct road from Italy to Germany, to Netherlands, Belgium, and the northern France. So between the richest region of Western Europe. It was only possible in the 13th century. And that's why there is this legend of the uh, Devil's Bridge. Because that's when it started. Before, nobody was going there. And the people who were living on those roads had a very important role because they could keep them open or they could close it. And the story of Switzerland starts along, along these roads through small communities of farmers. They collect taxes from the merchants and then small towns develop at the foot of the Alps on the north and on the south side. That's why I'm calling, talking about geography. Without bridges, without the Alps, there would not be Switzerland today. They had a very strategic role, because if you wanted to cross the Alps with an army, you had to pass through these roads. Hannibal did it, Suvorov did it, Napoleon did it, everybody did it, the, Rom the Romans did it too. So within the German Empire, the Swiss very quickly after a few hundred years, got not independence, but what they called, what was called immediate, immediacy. Remember, Europe in the Middle Age was feudal. You had the king, then a prince, then a duke, then a count, then a marquess. It was feudality. The Swiss were at the complete bottom. They were not kings or, 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 or uh, uh, noble of any kind. But they were important because of the roads. So they obtained from the emperor the guarantee that nobody would be between the emperor and them, which means de facto they were free because the emperor was very far away and he did not care, as long as the roads were open for traffic, for armies, for trade, for people, and so on. In those days, until the 19th century, there was no Switzerland. If you read the history books, they talk about the Swiss people. They were calling themselves Swiss. But there was no country called Switzerland. There were small, little republics bound by alliance within each other. But they had no government together. They had just a meeting 
the diet, the Duma, if you want, where every republic was sending somebody once a year. They had to agree on everything, like the Liberum veto in Poland. If they did not agree, if just one was against, they would not do anything. So it was not a real country. The people were already living together. They were free from uh, uh, feudality, but it was not a modern country. Uh, things change at the end of the 18th century. What was Switzerland when Napoleon, when Napoleon came to power? Switzerland was the, one of the poorest countries of Europe. It was poorer than Poland. It was poorer than Ukraine. It was poorer than the majority of the countries. Why? Because Switzerland has nothing. No oil, no gas, no uranium, no gold. And even the ground, the earth, is very poor. The only thing we have is water and people. So the only export product of Switzerland was people. That's why you had Swiss soldiers in all the armies of Europe. You know, in Borodino, I went to Borodino, you see the Swiss with Napoleon, but they were Swiss with the Russian army too. And very often the Swiss found themselves in battles fighting against each other. It was the only way to survive. One soldier could feed five, ten, twenty families in Switzerland. And in the, if you take, for instance, the wars of succession of Spain in the 18th century, there were big battles in what is today Belgium, in Oudenard, in Malpaquet. Twenty percent of the death were Swiss in those armies. And it was the succession of Spain. So the Swiss, they did not care, but they died. So emigration, of course, very strong emigration, and mercenaries. The French invade Switzerland because of the strategic value of these roads. At the beginning of, at the end of the 18th century, it was the revolutionary armies before Napoleon. You know the Napoleon Wars, Napoleon loses the war and there is Vienna and Switzerland is reinstated. And there, one point is important, it's the Tsar Alexander I who was very helpful in one point. The winners of the Holy Alliance had beaten the revolutionary armies and Napoleon's friends. Many wanted to come back to the old regime. The old regime in Switzerland meant very few people had all the rights and the big majority of people had no rights. That's why when the French army invaded Switzerland, the Swiss did not fight much because they were not fighting for themselves. And Metternich want, and Talleyrand wanted to reinstate the old system in Switzerland. And it's Alexander I who said no. Maybe thanks to Lagarde, I don't know. But he said, no, they had liberties. They should keep the liberties that they had after the French invasion. I don't know why Alexander did not do the same for Poland, but for Switzerland, he did it. And the neutrality of Switzerland starts at that very moment. In 1815, the big powers of Europe, France, Britain, um, Austria, and Russia, declare that Switzerland has to be neutral. Why? Because of the roads. It's easier to, keep, to leave Switzerland in peace, but the roads have to be open, than to fight constantly to take the roads like France did it and other countries did it before. So the neutrality of Switzerland was in the interest of Europe. Keep the roads open, and in Vienna, in 1815, it was as well decided that Switzerland has to have one national army. We did not have a national army. Every canton had his little army. So they said, you are neutral, you keep the roads open, and you have an army to fight if somebody wants to control the roads. So 1815, it's actually the origin of Swiss neutrality as we have it today. The, um, 
the state we made after that is the state that came out of the great, the big liberal revolutions of the 19th century. You had it in 1830. The French had it as well. We had it in 1847. We even had a civil war in Switzerland, like in the United States, but it made only 90 deaths. So it was a very civil, civil war. It made only 90 deaths. And the modern state was built at the mid 19th century. Again, very poor country. So the first decision of the new government was to invest in universities and polytechnic schools. If you have only people, you have to invest in people when you have nothing else. And like in Russia, the railroad. The railroad built the country, as same as for you or for Canada or for the United States, the rail, the, 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 the train is the most important way to modernize a country because it makes you build an industry to build trains and engines because uh, you, have it, you have to have uh, educated workers for the train, and because it connects the different parts of the country together. It helps for the exchange of goods, of people, of ideas, and so on. So the train in our history plays a role similar to the train in your history or in the history of Canada and the US. When, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, a convention, an international convention, was uh, uh, adopted to define the role and the duties of the neutral state. It's uh, the Hague Convention of 1907. And these duties of the neutral state are very limited. Basically, the only thing the neutral state has to do is not to engage to treat one party to an international conflict differently to the other. So a neutral state can sell arms according to the convention, but he must sell it to both parties. He can sell goods, he can trade, but he cannot privilege one party over the other one. So it's very, very, very limited. And it's only in case of international conflict. So a conflict between one state and another state or two states and, 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 and another state. The neutrality we have in Switzerland goes further than that, of course, because it grew up out of the practice we had in the 20th century. First step after the, the First World War, the League of Nations. The League of Nations is established in Geneva. The Swiss enter the League of Nations. They adopt all the obligations of the League of Nations. Economic sanctions, even military intervention is accepted by Switzerland uh, 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 in the 20s. But as you know, the League of Nations was a failure. It failed. It failed because of Japan. It failed because of the invasion of Ethiopia by Italy. It failed because of Germany, of course, as well. And uh, uh, um, it was, it was uh, absolutely uh, not in a position to avoid the Second World War. So after the Second World War, Switzerland went back to a stricter form of neutrality. It did not join the UN, United Nations. It did not accept any economic sanctions or whatever. And we developed the notion of a permanent neutral state. What is a permanent neutral state? The Hague Convention 1907. When there is a war, if you are a country, you can say, I announce that I am neutral. By doing that, you have to treat both parties on the same way. Permanent neutrality is something else. It's a country that says, whatever happens in the future, I will always be neutral. So what do you have to do so people believe that you will be neutral? One main thing you have to do, or rather not to do, is to enter a military alliance. Because if you enter a military alliance and there is a war, you might have to fight because of this alliance. So you will not be neutral. And that's why Switzerland never joined NATO. 
because you cannot be neutral and member of NATO. So the neutrality of Switzerland after the Second World War was stricter than before. There is another reason, which is not a very glorious reason. It's because in the Second World War, we were during three years surrounded by fascist countries. By the Germans, they had taken Austria, eaten up Austria, and they had occupied France, and Italy was in the south. So we had to make concessions to survive, a bit like the Swedes, which is we allowed troops to pass Switzerland by train. We were selling them arms. And after the Second World War, some countries came to the Swiss and said, well, you haven't been really uh, uh, impartial in the war, especially the Americans and the Soviet Union. So that was another reason why after the war we say, OK, now we understood we will be strictly neutral from now on. And the neutrality in the second part of the 20th century of Switzerland is strict. This um, changed when we joined the United Nations in 2002. We had two referendums on the United Nations. The first, the people said no. And then, some years later, the people said yes. So by entering the United Nations, of course, we accept the obligation of the Charter of the United Nations, which means we agree to implement the decision of the Security Council. We will never send troops to fight, never. This we cannot because of our constitution. But if the Security Council adopts sanctions, as it did on North Korea, for instance, or other countries, then Switzerland is bound and implements those sanctions too. You have the sanctions taken in the Security Council. These are the multilateral sanctions. But then you have a new way of making politics today is unilateral sanctions. Your sanctions, the sanction of Russia against some products, from uh, the European Union, the sanctions of the European Union against uh, 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 Russia, the sanctions of America, of the United States, against Russia, and so on. So for us, Switzerland, it's a bit difficult. What do we do? It's not a war, a sanction. It's an act of, it's an unfriendly act, but we are in the realm of trade and economics. So it's not an act of war. So the Convention of Neutrality does not apply. We can do what we want. Being neutral applies only when you have an international conflict, not economic sanctions, or not terrorist acts. If there is terrorist organization that makes a bomb in a country, Switzerland is not neutral, because terrorism is a crime. It's not a country. It's not an international war. So when you have unilateral sanctions, we had to take two things into account. First, as we are permanently neutral, we cannot, we don't want to do automatically what a group of countries is doing. Because if we do that, the other countries will tell us, well, you are not neutral. When a group of countries, let's take the European Union, does something, you, Switzerland, you always do the same. So where is your permanent neutrality? Which means every time there is an act of economic sanctions, we analyze it and we decide whether we will do it fully, partly, not at all, or do something else. I would distinguish three situations. The first is war, when there is fight like in the Donbass. It's not an international conflict. It's not a country, a conflict between two countries, between Ukraine and Russia or, or whatever. But it's a conflict. People are being killed, 10,000, 12,000 people already. So it's an internal conflict in Ukraine. So in this case, Switzerland's law obliges us to refrain from exporting weapons 
to the country. That's why we have no, we cannot export weapons to Ukraine. Not because uh, we are applying sanctions on Ukraine, but because as a neutral country, we don't want to sell arms in a country that is in a war, internal or international. The second aspect are the what that's a very, very common uh, thing today, much more important than weapons, it's what they call the dual-use goods. A weapon is something you use to kill somebody. A dual-use good is something you can use to kill somebody or for something else. Take, for instance, the engine for an airplane. If you make engines, you cannot kill somebody with an engine. And yes, you bang him on the head, but uh, it's, not, it's not the task of the engine. <coughs> the engine can be put on a military plane, on a fighter, or it can be put on a civilian plane. That's why we called it dual use. So with dual use goods, we are very careful, and we want to be sure that the person who buys the engine will put it on a civilian airplane and not on a military airplane. And the third aspect is international law. For Switzerland, Switzerland is a very small country. So for us, the respect of international law is extremely important because we are not strong enough to impose our will on other countries or people. So when there is a breach of international law, then we might adopt our own sanctions. That's why the only sanctions we have, our sanctions we have put placed on uh, 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 Russia, are the sanctions concerning the Crim. After the, 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 what we call the annexion of Crim, no Swiss companies can, take, can make investment in the Crim or deal with companies from the Crim. That's the only sanctions uh, uh, Switzerland has adopted. This is because of the importance of international law for us. The other sanctions of the European Union applied on Russia because of the conflict in the Donbass, we did not adopt them. Not because we want to be nice. Not because we think Russia is right and the EU is wrong. Not at all. It's just because we have there a situation, a difficult situation between the EU and Russia, and we do not want to do something where we could be part, we could be looked as taking side. But if we don't take sanctions, the European Union will tell us, well, if you don't take sanctions, you take sides with the Russians. So it's difficult. If we take sanctions, the Russians will tell us, you're not neutral, you're siding with the EU. And if we don't do anything, the European will tell the same. Well, you don't do sanctions, so you are with the Russians. So we thought, a lot and we found something we said we will do it this way we will not take any sanctions on Russia but we will make sure Switzerland is not used to bypass sanctions that is we do not apply sanctions but we check we tell our banks our companies make sure Switzerland is not used to do sanction busting, to make deals between European companies and Russian companies that they cannot do because of the sanctions. So our Swiss companies can still do whatever they want, but it has to be the normal situation, business as usual. There were as well sanctions against individuals, the freezing of assets. We say no, we will not freeze assets, but we don't want that everybody puts the money in Switzerland. So we told the banks, make sure it stays at about the same, you know, the same business as before. By doing that, Russia is not happy and the European Union is not happy. So both are criticizing Switzerland, but I think this is what we had to do. We will never have a situation where both say, okay, wonderful, what you did is wonderful. So <laughs> usually we make both sides unhappy by trying to find our way between those things. I mentioned the European Union. Why Switzerland is not in the European Union? And I think there are three reasons. 
The first is, after the Second World War, you know in Russia more than in any other country how awful and terrible these two European civil wars were. It killed millions of people. My wife, uh, his, her grandmother lived in northern France. In her village, there is a cemetery. In this cemetery, there are eight graves. Eight boys from the same mother and the same father, who died in the same war, from 1914 to 1918. The mother had eight boys. They were all killed. Every six months, one had to be buried in that place. The whole family was decimated. So after the Second World War, you had a huge movement in Europe to decide to make war between Europeans impossible. Because that kills so many people, millions of people. And it drags the whole world into the war. So the European Union was not just an international organization. It was the idea that if you put sovereignty together, you cannot make war against each other. So it's not a peace treaty, because a peace treaty, you can say a peace treaty and then try and still attack your neighbor, even if you have a treaty with it. But if you pool sovereignty, like when you make a federation, less than that, but you just take all decisions together, like in a big family, then you make war impossible. And this has worked wonderfully. Now, who could think there would be a war between France and Germany? or between Italy and Spain, or between Hungary and Austria. No, that's not possible. That was the first reason. For us in Switzerland, it was not a reason, because we never had those wars. We were in our mountains, looking down at the people fighting, and it was awful, but it did not happen in our territory. We did not lose blood. So this urge to avoid a new war was not felt in Switzerland. The second argument is that every time Europe was united around Switzerland, it was always in dictatorship or in war, from Napoleon or Hitler. So for us, we, had, we were worried. What does it mean when they are pulling themselves together? We did not see that it was a good and a very important thing. The third reason is due to the nature of Switzerland. Switzerland has no common language. You have Russians. Russia has no common religion. You still have the Orthodoxy and the Patriarchate. We don't have it. We have Catholics and Protestants. French-speaking Catholics, Italian-speaking Protestants, German-speaking Catholic, German-speaking Protestants, everything, every possible thing. We have no natural unity. So we probably worry that if we enter into something big, the country will dissolve itself. Germany was divided for decades, but still it survived because the German Poland was out of the maps for a long time, but Poland was still there because they have a natural unity, the Polish language, the Catholic Church, and so on. We don't have that in Switzerland. And that's another reason why we stayed out of the European Union, probably. But, of course, we are very much integrated in the European Union. We are in the middle of it. All of the big majority of the trade is done with the European Union. We have one million Europeans living in Switzerland. We have, we have uh, lots of marriage between Swiss and Europeans and the other way around. And uh, 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 take our border, the border of Switzerland, it is crossed every day more than one million times. One million two hundred thousand times every day. It is more than the border between America and Mexico and the border between America and Canada together. You know, tourists, uh, uh, merchants, workers, everybody, trucks, trains, everything. So the country is completely integrated in the European Union, but we are not in the European Union. 
And that's why when the European Union takes decision, we still have to look very closely at it. I give you one example to come back to the sanctions. In the context of the Donbass, the European Union has put travel ban on a certain number of Russian citizens. They cannot travel to the European Union. The European Union has a common space, which is called Schengen. When you have a visa, you can go to all countries of the Schengen space. You don't have to ask for a visa for Italy, and then you go to France for a visa to France, and then to Luxembourg, and then to Germany, and so on. No, you have a Schengen visa, so you can go everywhere. It's very practical. Switzerland is in Schengen. So that was our problem. Let's imagine your, your dean is under sanctions. He cannot travel to the... No, it's not true. It's not true. It's, a, <laughs> it's hypothetical. So, and he comes to Switzerland. He wants to come to Switzerland. So he comes to my embassy. They say, hello, Mr. Ambassador, I want to go to Switzerland to check my bank account there and so on. <laughs> and uh, uh, um, can I have a visa? And I say, of course, we don't have sanctions. So you are not on the list, we don't apply this list. But if I give him a Schengen visa, he can enter Switzerland and then go to France and so on. And then we have the problem I mentioned before. Switzerland is used to bypass sanctions. So we had to think about it very strongly. And we said, OK, in the case of the dean, because he's under sanctions, he's not under sanctions, it's just for the <laughs> Because of the dean, we will not give him a Schengen visa. We will give him a visa just for Switzerland. And we will tell him, be careful, because the border is open between Switzerland and France and Italy and Germany. We can give him a visa, but he can go only to Switzerland. And then he has to go back or somewhere else, but we will not give him a Schengen visa. And this is an example how we always have to wiggle between uh, 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 these obligations in such a difficult situation. The future of our neutrality is very difficult to, to say. When we entered the United Nations, we reiterated our permanent neutrality. So not being member of a military alliance, not doing things that might give the impression that you're taking sides. Again, only when it's about country, countries, not terrorist organizations, not mafia, criminal organizations, and the, uh, all the, not criminality, only countries. The other aspect of our neutrality is, like in 1815, <clears throat> the powers wanted Switzerland neutral because it was in their interest, keeping the roads open of the Alps. Today, these roads through the Alps, they are of no strategic interest anymore. They are only good if you have a motorbike in summer. It's wonderful. You can, you can drive up and drive down. But strategically, for armies, for trade, they are not important. You have planes, you have drones, you have missiles, uh, you have motorways. So this neutrality is no longer in the interest of the rest of Europe. So we had to find another way to be in the interest, at the service of others. And that's what we call our peace and security policy. That's why when you see that talks are taking place between countries that have a problem. These talks are very often in Geneva. That is big, why, because Switzerland talks to everybody. We talk even to Hezbollah. We talk uh, uh, to Iran. We are between, we are dealing uh, uh, and representing the interests of the United States in Iran. You know, United States and Iran are not in a very friendly terms today. And they don't have diplomatic relations. The Switzerland is doing not a mediation, but we are helping uh, matters between Iran and the United States. And we do it as well between Russia and Georgia. Because after 2008, they broke diplomatic relationship. So here in Moscow, I represent the Georgian interests. And my colleague in Tbilisi represents the Russian interests in Georgia. 
what does it mean? It means <clears throat> you still have a Georgian embassy in Moscow. But if you go and look at it, you will see something interesting. There is a Swiss flag on it. It's full of Georgians. But they are part, formerly part, of the Swiss embassy. And there is a Swiss flag and there is a Swiss plaque. And they are protected by Switzerland. It's the same in Tiflis, in, Tif in Tbilisi. You've got the big Russian embassy. It has a Swiss flag, and they are protected by the very small Swiss embassy. The Swiss embassy is much smaller than the Russian embassy. But it's the small one that protects the big one, because there, is, there are no diplomatic relations between the two countries. So whenever there is a formal uh, 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 request, it never goes from the Georgians in Moscow to the ministries in, uh, in, uh, in the Russian government, it always goes through the Swiss embassy, and we, uh, um, we push the matter, and we try to help finding solutions. That's why, as well, there are so many meetings, sometimes confidential, sometimes less confidential, organized and they taken by Switzerland, particularly with warring parties. We were very active, for instance, in the peace process in Colombia, between the FARC, the terrorist, was a non terrorist organization, who made a peace deal with the government of Colombia. The Switzerland was not only Switzerland, there were two other countries as well, but we were as well helping there. The fact that we have never have a no contact policy, many countries today have a no contact policy, uh, that is, they say, I will never talk to these guys, I will never talk to Hamas, Hezbollah, the Iranians, the Syrian government, or whatever. Switzerland never applies the no-contact policy. That is as well in the idea that we are neutral, so our way to help in difficult situation, in conflict, in peace, to help uh, uh, to promote peace in a difficult situation is by doing this, uh, uh, this work. And there are dozens, dozens of examples. If you have any questions, you can ask me about it. Well, I think I talked long enough. I'm sorry about the rector, to, to take your, not the rector, your dean as an example. Again, he's not under sanctions. You can, st <laughs> you can still talk to him and trust him. And, uh, and I don't know of any bank account he has in Switzerland. <laughs> okay, спасибо за терпение и за внимание. Thank you.